please welcome to the stage Clarence Otis, former chairman and CEO of Darden Restaurants. Moderated by Clint Grimes, Senior Vice President and Chief Procurement Officer at Capital One. Good afternoon and welcome to Lessons from the C-Suite and Beyond. I, I'm joined today by Clarence Otis Jr. Hi Clarence, how are you? Good Clint, how are you? I'm, I'm really good, really good. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of, of you taking the time for this session. I've, I've watched your career for a while um, and that'll become clear as we, as we talk. Um, so I just wanna dive right into it if you're okay. Absolutely. Okay, so in the early 2000s, black Americans remained rare as chief executives of Fortune 500 companies here in the US. Uh, and when you were named CEO of Darden Restaurants, you were one of just seven. And what's interesting for me personally is that was the same year that I joined Time Warner. Um, and as you recall, we had a black CEO as well in Dick Parsons. And I have to tell you, having someone who looks like me further up the food chain that I could identify with was really instrumental for me in sort of as I thought about my career and the opportunities moving forward. So um, you were a bit of an inspiration, I have to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, why don't we start? Can you walk us through your journey? Like tell us how you ended up being the CEO of that. Well, professionally, I, uh, I got started out of law school. So I'd gone to college at Williams College uh, in Massachusetts, was a econ political science major, went to law school uh, at Stanford. So back home for me, I grew up in Southern California, went to law school in Northern California at Stanford, and then did what most people were doing at Stanford at that time, and probably still today, and joined a law firm. In my case, uh, a New York City law firm. I wanted to be in New York. I loved going to New York when I was in college. And so started there as a securities litigator and really um, didn't like the law, loved the whole securities arena. I thought what other people were doing there was more interesting than what the lawyers were doing. And so I made the transition uh, from law to investment banking. And I'd been an M&A lawyer, but on the investment banking side, I thought public finance was intriguing. That whole sort of combination of finance and clients who are uh, cared about public policy and politics and so i did public finance uh for 12 years after four years as a lawyer and then got recruited away from there to be the treasurer of a company that was being spun out of general mills and that was darden and so that was really my first sort of move into uh the corporate arena as an operator, as opposed to running a finance unit. And uh, at Darden, I got lots of opportunities to do lots of things. Ultimately came up the finance side to be CFO. And then uh, after about nine years there, uh, was asked to be the CEO. And I spent 10 years as the CEO. That's an amazing trajectory. But were there any experiences like early in your career or during that journey that gave you the, the thought, the impression that you were destined for the C-suite and ultimately the CEO role? Yeah, I don't know about destined for. I guess um, as I was working as an investment banker, you know, you start like most people do as an account officer. Uh, and so you're essentially doing transit transactions uh, as a junior account officer. And then you get in a position where you're doing business development. So bringing in the deals and other people on your team are doing the deals. I thought all that was interesting, but I really was more interested in the enterprise that we were working for and how that was being managed and direction set for it. So I wanted to move into management and out of sort of being an account officer and ultimately got that opportunity from a guy that had worked at a firm I worked at. So I'd moved on from that firm, but he moved on to a different firm as well, called me one day 
uh, with the opportunity to lead to run uh, the municipal securities group at what was then the old chemical bank. Mm -hmm. And so this is the bank that ultimately was the catalyst for the roll up that today is JP Morgan Chase. And uh, so that was the first time I had management experience and I enjoyed it and I felt like I could be a senior leader, uh, but that road at the bank was gonna take a while. That was okay, I was prepared for it. But then getting recruited over to, uh, to Darden put me in a different place. And so I'd gone from being, I don't know what you would call it, because my unit at the bank was relatively small. So I was either junior senior management or senior middle management uh, and went from that to being treasurer, where I also had responsibility for um, investor relations. And so now I'm interfacing with the CFO and the CEO all the time. So I'm clearly on the management team. And that was the first time I really felt like, yeah, this getting to the C-suite is certainly possible. I was still relatively young at that time, 39. And so that was the first sort of concrete uh, sort of evidence. I think, though, I'd always thought I could be a corporate leader, and I always wanted to be a corporate leader. You know, my background, I grew up in Watts in Southern California, in Los Angeles, and it was a community that really had a lot of things going on. It was the center of the black arts movement in LA, the center of the black power movement. So a lot of people were investing a lot of time in seeing that we could succeed. And I felt coming out of that, that, uh, that we needed to have a presence in the corporate sector and because there were so many resources that were being directed and managed. And I thought that needed a more of a focus on helping develop communities like what? So I'd always wanted to be a senior corporate leader, but specifically getting to that point where I thought it was real would have been when I got the treasurer's job at Darden. Yeah. There's an interesting backstory there. I did some, some background research on you. And so you were born in Mississippi, right? That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. I was born next door in Arkansas, so I oh, okay. I'm ready <laughs> down south. So I, I there was a significant transition, I think, from Mississippi to Watts, but you were young, right? Very. Young. I was very young. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was only four years old when uh, my family, my parents, who were both born in Mississippi, left. We were in Vicksburg and moved to Watts, and so ultimately, that's really where I grew up. I mean, my junior year in high school. I like to tell people we moved up because in fact, it was a move up. We moved from Watts to Compton. And uh, so it's Watts Compton. That's uh, essentially where I, uh, I grew up. And the other transition from Watts to Williams seems pretty unlikely. So, so you know, take us through that just for a little bit. Like how, how did that transition come? Well, I think it was a lot of different things coming together. So one was, and this is uh, part of the story, I think, for the emergence of black CEOs at the time that they started to emerge. One was just the social time. So I came along, graduated from high school in 73. And so there'd been a lot of work, a lot of agitating. Uh, the Southern Civil Rights Movement, the urban sort of black power movements like we had in LA uh, to make places like Williams accessible uh, to black folks. I mean, prior to that, for the most part, we went to historically black colleges and universities, or if you're out West, where that wasn't so much the case, uh, we went to commuter sort of universities, the Cal State system, Cal State LA, Cal State Long Beach. And so all these people had done all this work. And so I, came of age, uh, college going age, at a point where some of these selective schools and the, the sort of flagship state universities were starting to have, you know, critical numbers of black students. And so that was an expectation 
even in a school like mine that was relatively under-resourced, uh, relatively was under-resourced, the most under-resourced high school in LA, there was an expectation that you're, if you were at the top of that class, call it the top 50 out of seven, 800 kids, that you ought to be thinking about going to a selective school. And so that's where we were directed. For us, ultimately, being out west, that generally meant Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley, or the Claremont Colleges, Pomona, and those others. Uh, but we had a guidance counselor at our high school that had gone to school in the east and so was encouraging us to look east. And I wanted to go to a school that was small. My sister was at Pomona at that time. That's the kind of school I wanted to go to. And so Williams emerged at the top of that list. And, uh, and I wanted to, uh, to be in a different environment, sort of get out of the city. You know, uh, at that time, cities were struggling, you know, and LA wasn't the only one, Boston, Chicago, New York. And uh, so I chose Williams. I think it's, it's amazing. So I, at the time, I would suspect that there were, even though the, the numbers were growing, there weren't terribly many Black students at Williams. Is that a fair statement? There were, uh, it was about 8% Black. And so okay. 2,000 folks, you know, uh, there were a decent number of us, you know, 150 or so, you know, uh, so 40, 45 a class, you know, maybe a little less than that. Uh, and so that was for a residential college, mm -hmm. a pretty big number. I mean, so it was a number that was big enough that we could create a community for ourselves uh, in the middle of nowhere, you know, through the Black Students Union, you know, Black dance companies, Black music groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it wasn't, you know, a big leap from, for somebody that grew up in an all-Black environment with that level of intensity. You know, the biggest differences were, of course, being in rural Massachusetts and being in cold weather uh, when you've never experienced winter uh, before. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, and and I'm, I'm contrasting that, or I want to contrast that with your journey, your career journey, because I would suspect that as a Black senior executive on the uh, C-suite track, um, you did find yourself more of an outsider or more of a minority in that environment maybe than you did at Williams. Is that, is that fair? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is fair. Um, I think that the thing about the journey that prepared me for the corporate world was that I had seen, you know, a, a wide spectrum of the country, you know, racially, socially, economically, and so just growing up where I grew up, there was a, a broader range of experiences than most people think, you know, going from folks who needed public assistance to people like my household where my father worked a couple of jobs and was a civil servant, a janitor, but a civil servant ultimately became head of custodial services for much of LAX. And so you had that breadth and then in the family, you had the same breath from, you know, very much working class to real strivers. Uh, and then that was complemented at Williams by experiencing black kids who came from backgrounds like mine all the way up to upper middle class and white kids uh, who were working class all the way up to uh, the wealthiest folks in the country. And so I had that sort of breath coming into the workplace. And so I could relate um, to a broad range of the folks in the workplace. That range on Wall Street wasn't super broad, but I could relate to the, the folks who were staffers, the secretary, the uh, cafeteria workers, the custodians, all the way right. up the ladder. And so that helped a lot. So great. So switching gears here, um, I want to talk about breaking into leadership. So, you know, breaking into that um, track and, and being on the track for the C-suite um, is hard. It's hard for anyone. 
but it's especially hard for a, being a black man in America. And we often need mentors and sponsors to help us along the way. As you think about it, can you name, are there any uh, sponsors or mentors that you've had in your career that have helped to guide you um, as you as your career growth um, happened? And what kind of advice, what kind of um, insight did they provide for you? Yeah, there have been, there've been many, you know, and I would say the first thing is um, in order to attract sponsorship, because I think that's more important, uh, in order to attract sponsorship. So people who will make your case for you when you're not in the room, and these may and often are not folks that you have any significant relationship with. Uh, to, to, to get sponsors, you have to be uh, seen as being a real strong performer. And so the first thing you have to do is develop a performance track record. And a lot of that starts with just being seen as a hard worker, someone that's willing to put in the time. Uh, but beyond that, of uh, producing, you know, getting great results, whether that's doing a transaction, or cultivating a client. And so the most important sponsor in my journey was a guy by the name of Tommy Becker. So my first investment bank was Kidder Peabody. I worked there, Tommy was there. He ran a group that was in our department, but not one that I worked in. I worked in a different group. And then ultimately a lot of things happened at Kidder. Uh, I left to go to First Boston. He left to go to Chemical. Uh, but he's the guy that called to talk to me about running that department. And so I think what he saw was hardworking guy um, who can produce results, uh, who seems to be able to get along with people and have leadership skills. And so he brought me in. And uh, again, it was not a guy I sat down with and talked about uh, what I wanted to do and all of that sort of stuff. But he's sort of hovering there in the background, observing. But I think it's important for people to understand that people are observing you. Um, now, on top of that, there are mentors and sponsors who you know. And the most important things they need beyond uh, a demonstrated track record, so hard work and results, is to understand what you want. And so you have to declare what you want. So I made it pretty clear as a, um, an account officer that I wanted to be a people leader, or a department leader. And I made it pretty clear, even in the interview, pro well, before that, at the old uh, chemical bank, that I wanted to progress up the organization, that running this unit was fine but I wanted to be a general manager and help run the organization. And so what's the path to that? And there were people that I'd have those conversations with that wound up being sponsors, not so much uh, mentors. I don't know that I had a lot of those other than friends who are going through similar things at other organizations. But one of those guys was a guy named, named Don Layton. And Don was two steps up. Uh, the latter from my boss, Tommy. And uh, so Don was aware of what I wanted to do. And he, when Walter Shipley, who was the CEO of the bank at that time, was looking to develop this sort of diversity, Chairman's Diversity Advisory Council, Don recommended that he talk to me about it. Uh, even though he was not a mentor, but he knew I wanted to to really engage at the enterprise level. And so that was a big step. That was a high profile assignment for me. So, so as you think about the, um, the audience here, and, and many of us are sort of in the middle or, or in my case, closer to the tail end, but middle of our careers, <laughs> as, we're, as we're going out and we are thinking about sponsors, you know, what, what advice would you give you know, someone as they're looking to create that 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 noise about them when they're not in the room. That's an, that's positive. 
um, like, you know, working hard. I, I completely agree with yep, that. Yep. You know, who, who should they be looking for or looking at or looking to influence, I think, um, as they go about this, go through this journey? I think they want to look around and, and, and see who is relatively accessible to them, uh, not so much because they report to them, but because they are in a position where they have to be aware of their work, right? And so that would be your boss's boss. That would be the HR leader that supports your boss and your boss's boss. And so you want to, whether it's through annual performance reviews, through sitting down at lunch, through having casual conversations in the hallway, you want those folks to get to know you, to understand sort of what you've accomplished, your track record, how you've gotten to where you've gotten, and what your vision is for yourself. And that vision for yourself has to be one that really starts with, here's what I think I can do to help the company get where the company wants to go. So it's a vision for yourself, but it's also a vision for the company and how you can make a bigger impact in realizing that, uh, that uh, vision. But it's, it's communicating with those folks uh, who are gonna be in a position where they have to understand what you do and they're accessible uh, to you. That's a great point. Um, but on the, the other side of that or, or a companion to that is the opportunities that come your way or the ones that you're considering. And one of the things that I, I think a number of us may be focused on a bit is titles. So in, in, a, in a number of cases, we find ourselves chasing titles conceptually because that's our, that's our, uh, our, our entry point or entree into you know, the, the next level of opportunities. As you were thinking about different opportunities that came your way, like how did you sort through those? How did you determine which were the right ones for you? Yeah, I think it was it was more about uh, stepping back and saying, what kind of impact can this role have? That's the starting point, not so much how it's titled. Uh, because the titles, you know, aren't reflective, really, of, of the work that needs to get done. You want to have a high-impact job, regardless of how they title that, because eventually that will lead to higher-impact jobs, and ultimately the titles will come. And so for me, that was a big part of it. I mean, one of the big experiences in my career around titles was uh, the first merger that uh, Chemical did on its journey to becoming J.P. Morgan Chase was with Manufacturers Handle. So I was running the Muni Group. Manny Haney had someone running the Muni Group. That was true across the entire organization. So in the beginning, they're sorting through who's going to win each of those jobs. And ultimately, uh, they got to a point where in the wholesale bank, which we were part of, they had all that sorted out. They ran an ad in the Wall Street Journal introducing, you know, the new team. And it must have been 40 people. Everyone in the ad was a managing director except me. I was a vice president. And so, you know, I hadn't got the title that I deserved but I was running a group, you know? And so that's all ultimately that matter. You know, it speaks to uh, the blinders of that time. So this is 1991, that no one recognized that, right? No one saw that you had one black person in the whole 40 people and that one person had the junior title. Um, and so, but it was really about, it was about the work. The other thing was when I got the offer uh, to go to Darden as treasurer, right? Vice president, treasurer, SVP, I forget what it was. And I went to Don Layton, you know, the guy who was two levels up from, from my boss. And I talked to him about it. And he said, well, you know, Walt, the CEO Shipley, 
and Bill Harrison, who ran the wholesale bank and who was his boss, he said, they like you and they will make a counter offer. It'll be a great title, uh, Don said, but you won't be on the management committee. And this is an offer to put you on the management committee. It's a small organization, but to be on the management committee of a public company before you're 40, don't pass that up, right? Forget about the titles that they're gonna offer you here. And he was absolutely right, I mean, he's absolutely right. So, so again, switching gears here a little bit. So at the ELC, we found the most successful corporate professionals can trace their success back to one of four A's, ability, attitude, assignment, and alliances. So looking back at your career track, which of the four was the most impactful for you? Uh, I would say attitude. You know, attitude was probably the most important. I, mean, I hear and I talk to a lot of younger professionals today and I hear this notion that I didn't hear a whole lot of when we were coming through about imposter syndrome. You know, I'm sort of here, you know, but I struggle with do I really deserve to be here? Uh, and I don't think of myself as arrogant. You know, I think humility is an important part of leadership. Uh, but I never had that problem. <laughs> I never had that problem. I always thought that I deserved to be there. So when I went to Williams, you know, I came from inner city high school, not as well resourced as my classmates. My SAT scores may have been a shade lower, but I firmly believed that I should be there. You know, that given uh, the resources that we had, you know, I'd done pretty well. This is where I need to be. and. Uh, and so I never felt like I didn't belong. And I had pretty good self-awareness because I could look around after that first semester and say, these guys aren't that, they aren't any more talented than I am. And so that attitude part, and it really is about good self-awareness because when I went to Stanford, you know, it was also clear to me uh, the first week or two that I could work day and night and 25, 40% of these kids were gonna outperform me just because they were that much smarter than I was. <laughs> Stanford was a different competitive, a different competitive playing field at the law school, at the Stanford Law School. And so I think attitude's important. Um, I think you need to feel like you belong. If you feel like you belong, then you're not afraid to be yourself. And so you're not trying to fit in and you know camouflage and hide parts of yourself and you're able to bring your full self to the place and therefore you know really maximize the opportunity i think a lot of people do feel like they need to tamp things down and uh, be something that they're not and that's a place of insecurity so i think attitude is what it's about. I never felt the need to change my diction, do any of that sort of stuff. And I always felt comfortable letting people know who I was and where I came from. And I think, so I think attitude is where it starts because if you don't have, you know, confidence in yourself, then the other things won't matter as much. You know, that, that's a great lesson, I think, for all of us. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, I, I also think is really important is that, you know, you have that self-awareness, and as you were talking about, and, and really, like, you know, you have skills and you have, you know, capabilities that got you where you are and sort of leaning yeah. into those and utilizing those to the best of your ability. Um, and even at, even at a place like Stanford, so that, that 25, 30% that were just going to perform, they were going to be law professors, right? I mean, they were going to go clerk. So it didn't matter. I mean, they had a different place that, that uh, they were going to maximize that because they didn't have a whole nother suite of skills in general that it took to perform in, a, in the marketplace. And so the fact that they were going to be order of the coif, I think that's what the uh, Phi Beta Kappa is in law school, and I wasn't, wasn't all that relevant. 
completely agree with you. <laughs> so in, in thinking about your, your career and your role as CEO, a lot of us would look to you and say that that's sort of the pinnacle of achievement that you've, you've made it and, uh, have, have, you know, job well done. Um, but not for you, you know, your career has continued even after your, your role as CEO of Darden. Um, so uh, my understanding, you're a corporate director on, uh, on, on some boards and, and I'd be curious about how, how you made that transition or how you thought about that transition from C-suite to corporate director. Well, I, uh, my first corporate board was before I became CEO. And so that was, uh, something I really wanted to do. I felt it would be helpful in my progression, uh, at, uh, at Darden. And so, you know, another guy who wound up being a mentor uh, is a guy named Bob Lip. So Bob had been part of Sandy Wiles' team, mm -hmm. but ultimately, you know, got to uh, Citigroup. And Bob and I served together on the Williams College board. And I let Bob know I wanted to be a corporate director. He thought it made sense. He said, that will do a lot for you internally in terms of really getting the attention of your leadership team and your board. And so Bob had retired, but when Sandy was going to spend Travers out, he asked Bob to come out of retirement and be the CEO. And Bob gave me that board opportunity. So very much sort of old boy network working for me uh, through the college alumni set. But that was my first board, and he was right. It did uh, get the attention internally that that I was someone that other organizations paid attention to. Um, from there, you know, it was really about uh, joining the Darden board as CEO, understanding uh, those board dynamics from that seat. I'd already been in board meetings, been, uh, and that was a huge advantage of being a finance leader. Treasurer, CFO is that you're in most of those meetings. So I knew how it worked, but not from the CEO's seat. But I, uh, once I got that CEO job and I had that board, I knew that boards are important, that they really can help shape the direction of an organization. And so as I thought about transitioning from working full time to not, I felt it was important. To, uh, to continue to be on the boards I was on and add a board. And so that's sort of how I thought about it. In, in that, what, what do you think that, you know, many of us that haven't been in that board um, position or reporting, you know, reporting out to the board, what do you think we get wrong about board service? Yeah, well, I think part of it is this, this uh, notion that you aren't, prepared for it, that you, there's some work that you need to do. And so, uh, you know, what frustrates me is all these board prep programs, you know, for senior leaders that have already demonstrated uh, as a result of their senior leadership journey and the level they've reached, that they're prepared for a board. They don't need prep. Uh, board members who are not black don't go to prep classes. You know, and so if you get someone that's gotten to the level that you're at, they're prepared to be a board member. And uh, I think what's been missing uh, historically is that the companies, as they look for board members, haven't opened the aperture wide enough, especially when it comes to uh, black directors or potential directors and other candidates of color. So they wanted to thread the needle. You got to have everything when people have reached the level where they can make a contribution. Someone at your level can make a contribution. Your counterpart at Dell, for example, has joined the board of a guy, the company, uh, the CEO of, uh, of that company, Kroger, sits on a board with me. And he sort of, you know, his reaction was, once I started digging into this, I realized there's no pipeline issue. That's absolutely right. There is a pipeline. And so what we've got to focus on is less about getting ready and more about making the connections. 
uh, with the people who make those board nominating decisions. And so that's something that I and some other folks have been working on. We need to get people who already demonstrated that they're board ready um, in front of those names and profiles in front of the people uh, who have the ability to fill those board slots. Oh, that's, that's great insight. Um, so in the few minutes we have left, I, I'm gonna have you look back at your career. So hindsight's 2020, you know, and someone who's, who's achieved as much as you have, have you ever wondered, you know, how some things might've gone differently had you acted differently? So if you could go back and you could just change one thing uh, on your first leadership role, um, what advice would you give yourself and why? I would say um, uh, I would probably be a little bit more patient. You know, in the, I mean, I've had a lot of different jobs at a lot of different organizations, more than most. I worked at two law firms, three investment banks uh, before Dart, so five moves. And some of those were premature that I would have learn more, had less anxiety if I would not made a couple of those switches. That one of the facts of life uh, as a black corporate leader is that you are in a position where you're gonna have to wait a little longer than your colleagues uh, for the next rung in the progression. That people really want demonstrated results. There, you just don't get that benefit of the doubt. And it can be frustrating and lead you to actually leave a position uh, where if you'd stayed and put in the extra year or two years, uh, you would have gotten what you wanted. I mean, it's unfair. It's not the way it ought to be, but it's the facts. Uh, and our generation, I don't know if that's still the case, used to call it the black tax. I mean, that's the black tax. And it was a tax I was unwilling to pay early on. Uh, and so that probably resulted in a little bit more churn than I needed to have. Interesting perspective. Uh, and then finally, what are a few resources that you'd recommend to someone looking to gain insight into becoming a better leader? Boy, I think uh, I, I'm not I'm not big on. Um, on self help books, that's never been anything. Uh, that I've, you know, really thought about. But the one author whose work gives you great insight into how companies should be thought about strategically is Jim Collins. So good to great, built to last. Uh, those are definitely books worth worth delving into. And um, uh, I forget the title of this last one of that trilogy, but that group, even though the work's been out there for a while, that really helps, I think, as you think about trying to sharpen your ability to help set corporate direction, uh, both in terms of strategic goals, in terms of the kind of culture that you need to be effective. That's great. So I think we're going to have to end it there. Clarence Otis Jr., uh, former CEO of Darden Restaurants. Uh, it's been my distinct pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, you know, it's been a pleasure uh, to meet you and, uh, you know, best to you in all of your future endeavors. Thank you so much.